Welcome everybody. I want to call to order the October meeting of the Local Public Safety Coordinating Council uh, in accord with Oregon public meetings laws. This meeting is recorded, so I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Uh, today's agenda is going to be about the county's, uh, uh, the response of the criminal justice system to COVID and a lot of the challenges that has uh, put forth. Um, and so we will get to that. All right, for the subject matter today is going to be COVID. And one of the things I was going to start was talking about community justice and our response. And community justice really entails three different divisions. We've got the juvenile division, adult supervision, and the transition center. And each of those has been impacted um, on a number of levels. I think community justice off, you know, deals with the courts, we deal with the jails, we deal with prison, we deal with the community. And so all of those pieces, and we deal with treatment and we deal with behavioral health. So all of those pieces have seen a pretty drastic change over the last, uh, well, since March, really. And so um, when we look at our juvenile division and juvenile services, um, there's a couple of different ways that it's been impacted. One is which is that we've limited detention admissions in an effort to keep uh, staff and youth safe. We have quarantine and um, cohorting going on within that facility so that we can um, minimize any infections that might occur. Uh, and, you know, we are having police cite and release youth that normally would be lodged, which can pose a challenge within our community. Um, and then with our education program and some of our um, other behavioral health programs, we see things and interventions that we normally had that just aren't there. So education is limited to 10 kids at a time in the classroom, puts a challenge on how to engage the other youth during the day. Um, and home visitation within some of our, our residential has been limited, which, again, one of the most important things we do is engage families when working with juveniles. Uh, we also have a no after school program as an alternative to detention. Um, our community service work crew for juveniles has seen a lot lower numbers. So POs are having to rely on other tools and not have that full array of services that we try and engage people in. But really within that, we've seen a higher reliance on virtual connections, which as you can imagine, juveniles are very comfortable with. Um, I was down there the other day and a PO said, oh, one of my youth is reaching out. They go to their office, pull the youth up on Zoom, and the youth began saying, I'm having this conflict with my parents. They're doing this, this, and this. The PO was able to do some skill building with the youth, role play them, and then the youth kind of went out and was able to engage their parent in real time. So we can't do that for every kid every time they call, but seeing different ways of interacting and engaging youth is something that despite all the hard, you know, very difficult things that COVID presents that we plan on carrying on even when we have access uh, to, be, to being more in the homes. Out of the transition center, uh, last year we averaged 120 clients at any one time, people who were residing in different parts of the program. Uh, currently, um, prior to the fires, we were averaging about 60 during COVID. And we did that so that we would have, be able to space adequately for the people who were sleeping in their bunks and in their different beds, um, so that we wouldn't have as much traffic coming in and out the door because there's a transitional housing and work release component out there. And we did it so that you know, we would be able to effectively work with the people we had and cohort the groups. And when I say cohort, uh, the way I use it within our facilities and programs is the idea that these 10 adults that are in custody or in our program, excuse me, won't connect with these 10 at any point in the program. So that if there is an infection, we can try and limit the, the damage and the extent of it without infecting everybody that we have there. So that does bring some different challenges and some new ways of doing business. We have to be very intentional in terms of how we work with people. Um, but out there, in addition to all the cleaning and temperature taking and other screening questions we have, those have been our primary strategies for working with folks. Um, and so then we've had to um, look at different staffing patterns and the, ways we, the way we train staff has been different out there. But those are primary Primarily the volume issue of not being able to um, serve as many people out there at the center has been the biggest difference. Um, within adult parole and probation, um, one of the things that we've had is a slowdown of the cases coming in on the front end. We've had fewer probations because I think Judge Mahee will get into this. The court isn't moving folks through right now due to COVID restrictions. So those probation intakes that we normally have, we just haven't seen. Um, and while we have seen more prison releases, as the governor has commuted a number of folks trying to make sure that adults in custody uh, on the prison side of things um, are healthy where they can be. There's been a large number of deaths within the prison system, 18 total, I believe, uh, due to COVID, which out of the 14,000 people that are imprisoned is a higher rate than the general population. Um, and that's forced us to kind of figure out different ways to transition people. And one of the challenges of that is that when somebody gets out of an Oregon institution, 
Um, right now, most of them getting out are coming from what they're considering an endemic facility. So a facility where there's a prevalence of COVID and that person is presumed to be exposed to COVID when they come to our community. The way we've been working with that is that we've been working with our Health and Human Services Department to get that person a room at a hotel. Um, they then isolate for 14 days, um, having very limited contact, having no contact with uh, the outside world really. Um, they have really good food. It's from Black Bear Diner, just like the rest of our citizens doing that do. So that kind of offsets some of it. But you can imagine a person getting out of prison thinking, boy, I just did two years, five years in prison. Now I get to go to McDonald's and see my loved ones and maybe rekindle an old relationship. And we're saying, no, you get to see nobody for 14 days. It's a tough pill for a lot of those folks to swallow. So getting them on board with what it takes to, um, to really abide by those rules is difficult because, you know, at the end of the day, we're not utilizing jail for those types of visit or of, um, uh, violations, particularly if the person is potentially infectious. We want to keep them out of that. So it's been challenging and POs and health department staff have used a lot of creativity in how to keep people there for the 14 days and try and keep our community as well as that individual safe. Um, we're doing a lot more uh, Zoom work at parole and probation. So seeing fewer clients in person, trying to decrease the amount of circulation within our lobby. Um, and within that, that has caused POs to use different skills. Some of them have been very adept at it. Others are just saying, you know, it's really hard for me to connect with the person. That's so much of what we do. So while we're going to keep a lot of the texting supports, Zoom meetings, even after COVID, there's really no substitute for being able to get into homes, have people come and see us in terms of the work we do. Um, we're utilizing less jail than we were previously. Um, we have, I think, reduced probably the use of jail by over 50% which is very difficult because one of the things that we try and do is provide those shorter term sanctions for people who otherwise would be looking at a prison sentence. If we can give them that short term in jail, stabilize them, transition them. We know we can be a lot more effective with supervision. So we're looking forward to be able to use that because a lot of the people that we work with really do need it um, as an intervention. Um, I want to make sure I get, a, get the most of those. Uh, fewer UAs due to not taking urine during the COVID um, time has meant that we're having to, uh, to kind of get creative with how we engage and how we identify when a person is struggling. Um, and so we've been making that transition as well. Uh, we do have concerns about the people we supervise right now that we don't have quite the contact level that we had um, maybe a year ago. And so when we look at things that happen in our community um, that we're only starting to learn about in terms of the uh, um, excuse me, uh, in terms of the overall effect of COVID, the effect of isolation, the effect of people having fewer contacts with different parts of our system, you know, it, it, I do have concerns as to what that might mean down the road. Uh, when we see the report, I think that came out yesterday from the Oregon Health Authority, that they've seen a 70% increase in Oregon opioid deaths during April, April and May um, you know, you wonder the effects of isolation. You wonder the effects of not being able to engage people. And whether that engagement should come from law enforcement, parole and probation, or mental health, it's just when it, without the, the, the physical interactions, I think there's some people that are going to be harmed and hurt within this whole epidemic. So those are some of the concerns we have. And I hope I, I measured that by some of the, the things we've learned from it. But make no, no mistake, it has been a lot more difficult to do the work we do under these, these conditions. And I'm sure that the other partners who are sharing today will probably present similar challenges in the work they do. So, so that's the community justice piece. And um, I certainly think for the purpose of this meeting, we can take questions um, by discipline or we can wait till the end as well. But, um, but with that, I'll, uh, I'll send it over to Judge Mejia, a presiding judge who's going to talk about the courts and kind of the, the challenges or changes in business that they've seen. Thank you. Um... Uh, February of this year, we had our annual State of the Court presentation to the Jackson County Bar. And quite frankly, I, I stated at that time uh, that the State of the Court was good and that we had a plan to move forward. The Chief Justice had issued a big strategic plan for 2021, and that's what we were there to talk about. Uh, during that uh, presentation, uh, yeah, more than one person made a some kind of COVID joke or one kind or another. I had a few in my quiver, but I'm glad I didn't use them. Because towards the end of the meeting, somebody says, hey, you know, this COVID thing, you ought to take it a little bit more seriously uh, than you seem to be doing at this time. 
And sure enough, that was so true. Uh, uh, As a background, you need to understand that the Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court is the administrator for the entire court system for throughout the state. And that's the first statute in ORS. It basically tells you that. The second statute says that Chief Justice basically controls everything. So by March 13th, we had uh, an order from the Chief Justice to postpone all trials except those that had already started. And that we needed to move to alternatives like settlement conferences and alternatives to trial. And we also had a reduced number of people in the courthouse And this has been her uh, mantra throughout the COVID thing. You need to do as much as you can remotely. Teleconference, telephone, whatever you do, you got to keep people out of the courthouse and uh, proceed in other fashions. And of course, we had to get on our website that if you're not feeling good, don't show up. Even if you're supposed to be here, been summoned here, just call the court and tell them you're ill, but then make an appointment to come back. And then the, uh, the another important uh, directive by the chief was we need to start working with our community partners to mitigate the, the effects of COVID. Well, it wasn't three days later that she issued her first formal chief justice order, and that was 20... And basically, she said, we're not going to have any trials between March 19th and the 27th, and any trial can be completed, but everything should be bumped after that. And then we had a number of things that we had to do, and we had to do in person still. So those were basically... uh, civil commitment hearings, protective orders like FAPA and stocking and other protective orders like elderly abuse prevention. We had to continue with the guardianships uh, issues and we could continue with the treatment court. They suggested we could do treatment court uh, remotely and and that's kind of where we've gone. Uh, And we had to get people out of the courthouse and not, not just the public, we had to get staff out of the courthouse to reduce that as well. And at that time, her directive was uh, social distancing would be three feet. Obviously, that has changed. Uh, And then, of course, everybody knows that uh, basically FEDs for non-payment of rent can't deal with that. We're not going to deal with that until the beginning of next year. However, we do still have, uh, that's landlord-tenant FED. Uh, we still have all those types of cases, but they just cannot be filed for failure to pay rent. Uh, so that was pretty good. Uh, any chief justice order that she issued gave me, as the presiding judge, a lot of discretion. These are the rules, but the presiding judge can make exceptions when they see fit if we have the staff to deal with stuff. Um, I have to tell you, uh, we've been one of the most open courts throughout the state, and that I'm talking about in-person people showing up. And uh, I know that because uh, Chief Justice called me once in the morning uh, before I even left for work, and she says, whoa, what are you guys doing down there? And she didn't say, close it down, slow it down. She just says, you got to be neat, you got to stay safe, and you got to keep the public safe and you got to keep your staff safe. So we continued and um, uh, we did have a skeleton crew at that point and uh, that order only lasted to the 27th of uh, that month and on uh, right before the 27th she issued a, an amended 2006 which kind of set the restrictions as to even more uh, strict, uh, not strictly, but explicitly what we were supposed to do and not be doing. So we had level two restrictions that was coming off level three restrictions, but that was only for counties who had moved to the first phase of the governor's opening plan. So that was us. So we could go to level two stuff, but we still had to bump all trials that were out of custody until after July 1. 
Yes, you could do your bench trials and things like that. But again, we had the exception that the PJ can do what the PJ wants to do as long as we have the staff and everybody is protected. Uh, then shortly after that, we had uh, another CJO 2017, and that's basically what we're operating under now. And uh, part of that was we had to have three mandatory uh, days that were nobody's going to be in the courthouse. And that was just basically to deal with staff issues and to also strategically plan to get some of that federal uh, backup to keep uh, salaries going for people. Uh, and the last uh, order she issued was 20-028. And that was just a re-emphasis of you got to do as much as you can remote. And there's been a lot of things that have happened in the courthouse. I got this beautiful computer in front of me with this uh, great screen that I, I can do this with you. We didn't have a lot of that uh, for judges before then. And we have all kinds of stuff in the courthouse to do those remote hearings. I agree with what Eric's saying. Uh, it's just not the same dealing with people remotely. I don't know if I'm wrong or I'm right, but I kind of think I have a good feeling for people uh, as who they are, what they are, what they're about. Maybe I'm totally off base, but when I can't see them, I, I don't jump to those hasty conclusions. So maybe that's a good thing. Uh, Quite frankly, I thought we were doing pretty good uh, as a court and a courthouse. Uh, and that delusion was dispelled in September when we got a report of uh, basically pending cases throughout the state. And uh, I think we've discussed this at numerous uh, meetings. Jackson County has one of the highest filing of charges of any county comparable to our size. Like Deschutes has half the cases we do. Huge Multnomah County has 185%. So we have a lot of cases compared to other courts. But the real bad news was as to these cases accumulating, we were third worst in the state. We had a 59% increase in pending cases. But it's even worse if you looked at the raw numbers. Uh, our raw, raw numbers, if I can put my glasses on, uh, we were 1,344 more cases pending on 9-11 of this year than we had in 9-11 of last year. So that's, that's huge. Uh, there's no other court that's even half that increase in raw number of cases. So, of course, as Eric suggested, a lot of that is due to not being able to process cases like we used to. Uh, I know I've talked about failure to appear every time anybody's asked me about what's going on in the court. We have horrendous failure to appear rates. Uh, I think that's, well, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, I do think that one of those reasons is capacity. There's just basically no sanction. Even these people that we used to hold on these um, chronic FTAs, they're, they're not in the jail right now. They're showing up uh, when they want to at court. So we're not able to hold those people anymore. Quite frankly, I've seen a lot of other people show up at morning arraignments that statutorily, they probably should have been in jail or they should have had a real high bail. But there's no room in the jail. So some of those people are doing good. Um, we finally got around to getting trials going, uh, that is criminal trials. We had no trials from March 13th of this year until July 21st of this year. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of things that we've done in the courthouse to kind of make that social distancing thing uh, work a little bit better and uh, what we have to do for trials. So let me see if I can get this on, all right. Well, I'll just deal with that. We had a bunch of pictures about basically what we've done. Uh, we've, but Judge you know, just, Mia, yes. would you like to email me your PowerPoint and I can share I, it? I can't. Every time I try to email it to myself, it's, it says too big. We don't have it. Okay. So what we've done, like you see at the stores, we have the lines where you, people have to step so far apart. 
And the real reason we're not doing a lot of trials is because it just takes so much space to do a jury trial. If you have a 12 person jury trial, you know, it was comfortable, uncomfortable enough to stick those people in those little deliberation rooms. Uh, I mean, they were basically elbow to elbow in that, uh, especially if we had a 13 or 14 person jury for a long case where some jurors might, uh, we might lose some jurors. Uh, so what we've done, uh, we can only have one trial at a time. And we've designated courtroom 201, that's Lisa Greif's, uh, Judge Greif's courtroom, that is our trial court. And the reason we do that is because uh, it's right across from the jury room. And so what we do is we bring reduced number of people into the court, uh, for void air, we have about 15 people in the in the actual courtroom, and we have 15 waiting in the jury room. So we're closed circuit TV to the jury room. So everybody that's not in the courtroom, are going to be potential jurors, they can hear all the questions that the attorneys ask at the beginning of the session. And then when we clear that, we go to the next group, and it's a lot easier with the next group. It's a lot faster because they've heard all the questions already. So we can keep that moving. Uh, and of course, we focus on in custody trials because yes, I understand how crowded the jail is and we just need to move some of those cases out of the jail. But quite frankly, we're not done as well as I think we should be doing. Uh, so what we're doing on that is we have a status hearing. Usually we have a status hearing on Monday for criminal cases that are gonna to go to trial that week. Now we do it twice a week. We do it the week before on a Thursday, and then we do it again on Monday. And the reason we do it on a Thursday is if somebody's telling us they're gonna to go to trial, we start calling jurors. I mean, we just don't send summons. We start calling jurors and ask them if, if they're gonna appear. And Quite frankly, we had real good response from the community. And when it comes to time for trial, they show up. I mean, it's no worse than it was before COVID time. We do tell people if you're sick or not feeling good, we don't want you here. Thank you very much. We'll defer your jury duty. Uh, and this is a big deal. I think we've, I think we've had more trials, but the numbers I'm getting are not good. Uh, but uh, what we've done that would really upset me is three or four times we told people we had a trial for them. And uh, for whatever reason, the trial did not go. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. So uh, I think that's, that's a horrible thing for us to do, to get citizens in here in the time of COVID and then just basically say, thank you, you can go home. Uh, I mean, that used to happen before COVID, but it, it's a much bigger deal now. Uh, we've only had one out of custody trial uh, during this time, but now we are ready to do uh, out of custody trials. And that's what we really need to do. When I was talking about those pending case numbers, we had a little meeting uh, with uh, some of our community partners and uh, Doug Ingle, who I guess is not here, uh, basically says is, you have no real threat of a trial. I mean, nobody's going to deal with anything until you have the potential to put them in front of a jury. So that has been a real difficult problem for us. But now we're ready to do it. Another big problem for us would be the co-defendant case or the big civil case. You know, you have two or three co-defendants, that means an attorney for each of them. And uh, we just can't get all those people at council table. You have a big, big malpractice trial, uh, you know, where somebody sues the hospital, the doctor, the anesthesiologist, everybody. That's huge. Uh, a lot of people at council table, we couldn't accommodate now. And uh, so what we were working on, and uh, we were trying to get set up at the pavilion over at the fairgrounds. They were willing to do that for us, but it just didn't work out. Anybody seeing anything on the, all right. Yes, okay. Your Honor, I think uh, we're good. Looks like we're good to go here. All right, so let's see what we got going here. 
That's basically the front of the building with all the signs. There's our security. It was a real interesting day, the first day that we told people they had to wear masks. Somebody showed up late to arraignments and they said, uh, I didn't have a mask. So I had to run to Providence Hospital to get a mask. Uh, that seemed really fishy to me because we had plans for to mask up everybody who showed up with that, without a mask. So I immediately ran down security. They opened one of those drawers. It was full of masks. I don't know why she told that lie. She made it to court, but uh, for whatever reason, she used that I don't have a mask excuse. And that stuff, you know, the lines at our windows, uh, that's on, the, I believe, on the Domrel side, social spacing, distancing. These are people in uh, basically their offices. Uh, our present rule is that you got to be six feet apart and in your cubicle and you don't have to wear a mask. I think that's probably going to change and it's probably going to change by order of the Chief Justice. Uh, you know, with the continuing developments on COVID and how it spreads, uh, she is very concerned about that. And of course, throughout the state, we have different views on how serious this is. And some, some judges or PJs are telling me uh, that uh, they kind of have an open rebellion by some judges about them wearing masks in court. And I have to tell you, my personal opinion is we do very well on the criminal side, not so great on the civil side for masks in court, but uh, nobody heard that. All right, there's some more people at their stations. Um, this is basically the jury room uh, when people are deliberating. Uh, so you see how far out their space from each other. So I guess they have to kind of be forceful in their opinion on how, what the case should resolve that. Uh, and there you go, some people waiting there. Got a lot, of, a lot of plexiglass throughout the building. And this is what we've done to all the courtrooms. Basically, we don't have a lot of space for people to sit in courtrooms. So when we have those big things like pre-trials and arraignments, uh, people kind of have to wait in the lobby and until uh, they're brought in. Uh, this is what we do to make sure people hear their rights. We basically play them on the TV, like if you had been in custody, that's how you hear your rights before afternoon arraignments. So we do the same thing because we can't have a big number of people in the court while I'm reading everybody their rights. So we, we do it in Spanish, we do it in English, constant rotation so everybody can hear their rights before they come into court. Uh, this is basically our people wrangler. And when we have those big uh, sessions, this woman is out in the hall getting the right people into the courtroom at the right time. And uh, quite frankly, I don't envy her job. Every time I come into court, almost every day when I come into court, just walk into my office, I have to tell three or four people or more to please put your mask on. And what I have to tell most people is cover your nose because a lot of people just cover their mouth and they think that's good. Of course, it's not good. Here's another thing we're doing. We're cleaning everything. For instance, uh, when I was talking about jurors, having half the jurors in at one time and the other half waiting in the jury assembly room, we clean those chairs in between the session, between the jurors. And here she is cleaning the doors. Uh, so that's basically it about the configuration of the courthouse. Uh, I do think we can do a lot better, but obviously uh, right now things are so uncertain in my opinion because of uh, third wave or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I mean, Jackson County and the state of Oregon had their highest infection rates last week. So uh, it's a big concern. Yes, I understand that it's not as bad or as not as many people are suffering as they did in the first place, but you know, we can't take those chances. We summon people into court. They have to be here. So if we're going to make them come here, we have to do everything we can to make them safe. Uh, I, 
I got a little bit more, but I, I don't want to use everybody else's time, but I'd be happy to talk a little bit more at the end if, if anybody wants to hear more. I just say one other big thing that is causing problems at the jail is the Ramos and the early or lay decisions. Ramos was in the uh, United States Supreme Court and Ulrey was in the Oregon Supreme Court. And they basically said, no, you cannot have anything less than a unanimous verdict. Oregon and Louisiana were the last two states in the country that allowed a verdict of 10 is good enough for guilty. And uh, so we were worried about that. And, you know, for the last year or more, I've been denying people's request that we have a unanimous verdict. Why? Because I had to. That was a case law in the state of Oregon. So even though I know it was a racist law and it was all, you know, to keep uh, Native Americans off the juries down here in Southern Oregon and perhaps Jewish people off the jury or to at least minimize their effect. That was kind of the issue in Portland. We kept denying unanimous verdicts. So now we're getting a lot of cases, not a lot, plenty, plenty though. Uh, I have to say some of those are resolved by just guilty pleas to time served. And uh, so, uh, all right, that's all I got for now, thanks. Thank you so much, Your Honor. I think that, you know, A, there's a lot of creativity going into the way that we're addressing these challenges. And B, I always appreciate how much each of the players within our system recognizes the needs and impacts of the other players, the way it interacts with the jail, the way uh, these things all kind of fit together. So definitely difficult times and um, certainly gold stars to you for getting your uh, share function to work. I'm not there yet, but uh, the fact that you could do that. I had help. Yeah, all right. All right. Uh, next on the list, Beth Heckert was going to share from uh, the district attorney's perspective how things have been going. So, Beth? Thanks. Um, so, just kind of going back historically as well. So, in March, we went remote. Um, so, we had half the people working in the building and half the people working from home. We only did that for about 60 days. So, we were one of the first county departments to bring folks back into the building. And we're fortunate that we have a nice new building and we have a lot of space in it so we could maintain our six foot distances and get people back in the building but we did learn a couple things we learned we could do a lot of functions remotely if we had to um, the things that we can't do remotely is grand jury or the da's perspective and our court appearances it has not worked out well at all in our mind to do court appearances remotely so we've gone to court and appeared in court um, with masks on and with social distancing, but we've done that throughout this whole um, time. Uh, the Part of the reason that we ended up coming back into the building after about 60 days was the court was starting to have some extra sessions to try to get smaller groups of people in. And so the more uh, sessions or the more court appearances that my folks have to make, we really needed people in the building for those. Uh, we're also fortunate that maybe we didn't really realize it, but not that many people in the public come into our building. So we, we initially had the signs up that said you had to make an appointment to come see us and everything. And uh, we really weren't having issues with that. We didn't have, we weren't turning away people in the public from uh, trying to reach us. The child support office is probably the one that gets the most foot traffic to come in and talk with folks. And uh, they worked around that by giving uh, phone appointments and are doing really well with that. I, I'm proud of uh, the way that we approached grand jury. So we were fortunate again to have a large conference room. So we moved the grand jury from their place, the place that we had built for them that works the best, but we moved them into the large conference room. They can get six foot distancing in there and we had we tried to get all witnesses to appear remotely. So if you were from home and you were talking about your burglary, we had you um, phone in and appear by FaceTime. Uh, if you showed up because you didn't know how to use that technology or you forgot or whatever, we put you in a separate room and you still FaceTimed into the room. So that really worked pretty well. And I think we were one of the only um, counties in the state who did that just right from the very beginning. Um, I know I shared that with a lot of other counties and then other counties moved to that. Initially we have, usually we have three grand jury groups a week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 
So we canceled the Wednesday folks and we just tried to do Measure 11 and Serious Crimes on the Tuesday, Thursday dockets. And we did that probably for uh, a couple of months. But the poor jurors who found themselves in this time frame, the grand jurors, um, you couldn't do orientation. We were still trying to figure out a lot of things. So the court extended their grand jury term. So they ended up serving two terms. Those um, folks in the community ended up serving um, for like 12 weeks or 13 weeks or something. So we have a few that dropped off and we had to have a few replacements, but that really worked um, pretty well for us too. During grand jury, the jurors are all wearing masks and the deputy DA in the room with them is wearing a mask. And that hasn't been too bad. We've had a little bit of resistance from jurors. Um, we had one issue with a juror saying, I don't have to do this because I'm sitting six feet apart from everybody. And then another juror saying, you should wear your mask. And then one juror saying, I don't have to do what you tell me to do <laughs> kind of stuff. So we had to have um, the judge come over and give them a little lecture about why wearing masks was important and was a directive from the court, that they needed to do that um, during court proceedings, and this is a court proceeding. So we haven't had any more issues after that. We get, we're get we orienting a new group um, next week. So hopefully that's really stressed to them and it won't be an issue again. Uh, because we all we were really doing was doing court appearances and our intake because um, we weren't doing a lot of other stuff, uh, the attorneys in the office. And so we got caught up on our intake, which is part of all those filings. Um, I was surprised. I kind of thought we our cases submitted to the office would be down, but when we ran the numbers compared to last year, we had more cases submitted to the office, um, not by a huge amount, but by, by 100, 150 cases than the same time frame last year. So our law enforcement is still out there making cases and submitting them to our office and we are getting them filed. But that's kind of then where they stop because there's not, um, the court appearances are pushed out further just because the court can only have so many people at a time. The trials were pushed out. Uh, so that has been an issue for us. Um, and I think we're, hopefully now we're gonna start having out of custody trials or as the judge explained, at least the threat of out of custody trials because that will get cases to resolve. Uh, we could do bench trials, but nobody, no defendants were waiving their jury to go bench because why, what was their incentive? Why would they want to resolve their cases quicker? They don't have the bad incentive. So, uh, so I think that we'll see a little bit of change there We've done a few jury trials, and the attorneys who've done them said they went pretty well. Uh, they're, they're different because the jurors are spread out throughout the entire courtroom. So sometimes you might be talking to someone who's like behind you, and you're not, you can't just stand in one spot like you could before and make your opening statements, or your closing arguments or something, and have them all right in front of you. Uh, jurors are wearing masks, so you can't read cues that you might get from just seeing somebody, body reactions or something like that. Um, but the trials that we've done so far, I think have worked out pretty well uh, from the, our attorney's point of view. So hopefully we will get more trials going uh, and that will help with a little bit of the backlog. I am concerned about co-defendant cases. Um, I realize the court, they do raise issues for the court, um, but they also, it's concerning to me for like the victims. So if a victim is gonna have to appear two or three times and go through a trial, um, because we weren't able to do a co-defendant case and have all three defendants tried at one time. That's not fair to the victims either, but we're doing the best we can, and I know the court is looking for alternative locations where we might be able to have um, co-defendant cases. And in reality, if, like you looked over last year, how many trials we did, about 35 or something is coming to mind, but that might be low. Um, but again, it's that threat that you could go to trial is what makes you resolve your cases. So um, I think as we can apply that pressure again, we'll get a better, um, we'll hopefully get some of these cases resolved. If the public wants to come and watch a trial or another attorney just wants to come watch what another attorney is doing, the court has been really good to set up um, another courtroom where you can just sit and watch it so you're not in the courtroom taking up one of those spaces because there are no spaces really left. If the victim wants to watch the trial, the court has been really good to let the victim actually sit in the room when it was possible. 
um, we had one case where that's what the victim wanted, and so the court accommodated that. Um, but most of the time, anyone else from the public who wants to come watch a trial can just watch it from another courtroom, and you can see the case that way. And then just finally, a couple other kind of uh, effects that are on our office. Um, petitions for clemency are way up for COVID reasons. So when, the, when someone files, when they're in prison and they file a petition for clemency, they ask the governor to um, let them out of prison. Uh, the governor reviews those and then typically they'll ask us what our position is on any that they're truly considering. And so we're seeing an uptick in how many of those that we have to respond to, um, notify victims of that someone's trying to do this. And then the second way that people are getting out of prison right now is the Department of Corrections is creating a list of COVID releases and then sending that list to the governor. So then the governor is instituting the release rather than the, the defendant petitioning or the prisoner petitioning for the release. And we've been getting, it seems like it's, I think they produce the list every other month. So I think last time uh, Jackson County had about 30 people on the list that, that the governor wanted to, or the Department of Corrections thought might be appropriate to release out of custody from prison. Um, and a lot of those were within 30 days, 60 days of release. We didn't object to any of those. But we did have some folks who had, uh, who were either looking at getting like, two-year reduction sentences or uh, we really felt were very dangerous folks and really needed to serve out all of their sentence. I think we filed objections on about seven or eight of the 30 that we got. Um, and that's the second round of those so that's just also taking up resources and time because we have to look up each of those cases, read the reports, figure out what the charges were about, see what, look at the criminal history, decide if we want to take a position or not. And I don't know whether that is going to have any effect on the governor and whether she releases these folks or not. Um, one of those people had started, had, had an uh, explosive device and so on the heels of the fire, that did not seem like a great idea and had 108 or 138 arrest cycles on his uh, criminal history. So he didn't seem like a great um, idea to release back into our community. And I worked with Eric on those folks because Eric is really the one who has to deal with them directly out of prison. Um, I'm just looking more from the sentence that we had the court impose, you know, that we got, whether that should um, be reduced or not reduced. Um, but Eric is the one who really has to deal with those folks when they come out and he talked a little bit about that putting up in hotel rooms and, you know, a lot of these folks are, um, are you know, could be serious offenders. They, there's not a ton of people in prison who don't have pretty serious charges and so that's the, the issue that they're running it against. They're not looking at any Measure 11s um, to reduce those, at least through the governor and Department of Corrections lists, the clemency lists could have Measure 11 people on them. But, so that's just creating kind of additional tasks to work on and do that we didn't have to do before. But other than that, I, we haven't had any cases within our office. Our staff has stayed healthy, thank goodness. Um, and we wear masks around the office. We don't have to wear them if we're sitting in our offices or we're sitting at our workstations. Um, but we're pretty careful about it, and like I said, we really don't get a ton of the public coming into the office. We're dealing with victims and witnesses mostly by Zoom calls or FaceTime or phone calls. So I think that was pretty much everything I thought about COVID response from the DA's office. No, thank you, Beth. I appreciate it. And thank you for bringing in the victim perspective, too, on what these delays and alterations can mean. Um, I think that's something that we all need to away within this process. Um, and as you say, we are getting these commutations and regardless of the public health concerns at the prisons, there's very real concerns we have within our community, which is the lack of housing due to the Almeda fire, the lack of transitional resources as basically we've cut all of our censuses in half with the idea that we need spacing. And so far the DOC has said that they are willing to take that into account, um, but we'll see how that goes with this current wave because that is an additional challenge that Jackson County has. Um, so thank you. Uh, Chief Clausen on the telephone, we've got you up to talk about um, the policing and, and Medford Police. So if you're ready, uh, we'll kick it over to you. Hi, I'm ready. Thanks, Eric. 
Um, yeah, I'll go back to March as well. Um, you know, when things shut down, we saw a pretty dramatic reduction in calls for service. Our our dispatch calls were reduced by 30%. And and so that, that in my opinion, captured the thefts that were not occurring. It, it captured the traffic crashes and traffic crimes that were not occurring because people just weren't out and about as much. Um, as things slowly open back up, um, those numbers have crept up slightly. But, um, you know, overall, crime continues to trend downward. So um, that's a, a positive thing. Um, my directive from from day one was to um, try to cite and release as many people in as possible in lieu of custody arrests. Um, for the most part, our folks have been able to do that with the exception of a few um, Measure 11 folks. Um, but they they were also encouraged for for about 60 days in the very beginning to not even do any traffic stops or any self-initiated activity just to completely reduce the, the risk of, of exposure. We have relaxed that somewhat um, now. It's for more egregious situations where there's human risk involved, we, we do make those traffic stops. So I think one of the biggest concerns, I know the sheriff would, would probably agree with me on this, is that, uh, you know, we're were we or would we be placed in a situation where we had to enforce the governor's orders? And that came up multiple times. And fortunately, I, I really feel that our state agencies have, have stepped up to the plate. They're doing a really good job. OSHA has been very aggressive down here. They're, they've, they've been easy to talk to and easy to make reports to. And so, We've had to have very little interaction with people, um, so that that's been great. Um, we um, internally are in a very similar situation as Beth. We have a newer building; we can really spread out. Um, we have lots of individual cubicles that are spread out, so our folks are wearing masks. They they don't like it, but um, it's <laughs> it's an executive order and it's rules from the state, so um, we we make it work. We have custodial staff that walks through the building three times a day and they wipe down the door handles with antiviral spray and um, we clean up all all our surfaces after every meeting um, with antiviral and. Uh, so overall, I think, uh, you know, it's the the stress on families is, is something that I think I'm more more keyed in on. Um, you know, I haven't seen a, a true negative effect as far as what we're doing out on the street. But what I'm seeing is just the stress on the families who are trying to deal with um, sc the school situation and um, kind of the unknown of this pandemic. So we've been very, very flexible with our time and with our sick time. And um, so that's been something we're just kind of monitoring. And then, of course, the Almeida fire situation kind of coming on the back of this and then the protests um, coming, you know, at the same time of this is has really placed a lot of stress on on our folks. And so We've got them plugged in with our chaplains and um, our EAP services and, and just doing a lot of positive education on that that topic. So uh, we'll continue to work through that and monitor that and, um, and provide support for our people. Um, we did have uh, layoffs within the city due to a reduction in uh, general funds. That affected us with two part-time staff members and one part uh, one full-time staff member so that was something that I in 25 years I've never had to deal with with the city of Medford we've to the best of my knowledge have never laid any, anyone off so um, that was a <laughs> very different experience and then I'll just mention just a couple positives that, that have really 
come from this pandemic. One, a lot of people now use the online reporting. Uh, though our, our cases have doubled. So uh, we pushed it on social media really hard, um, just encouraging people to make the reports online. We, we staffed that online reporting system so that we can get back to people right away. And that's been very successful. So we're finding that it's um, not only does it reduce contact with an officer, but it's also very, very efficient. And I think it also kind of appeals to our millennials who would practically like to get be on a computer anyway. And then the other thing is the sheriff and I worked on the urban campground concept and, and it was just a, an idea to, to get some of our homeless off of the greenway and out of the heavy vegetation. Um, and, and we were so, um, so limited with uh, COVID. We couldn't use our normal housing, traditional housing like jail and transition center to move those folks. And the urban campground was created and it's been a, a huge success. It, it really is working to get people into um, the next level of transitional housing and onto permanent supportive housing. So I think that's, uh, that's two of my, my positive takeaways from, from this whole situation. That's all I have, Eric. Well, thank you, Chief. I certainly appreciate any positives we can find, but I also appreciate you bringing up the, the emotional stress on families and uh, staff as they do this work. Uh, given the set of uh, challenges we're all facing. Um, and speaking of challenges, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I really do believe Lieutenant Aldrich has the most challenging, uh, really, order of all of us in terms of managing a jail that's already undersized and outdated, but within the given, uh, const you know, constraints of, of COVID. And Lieutenant, every time I talk to you, you're upbeat and positive. So uh, I'll kick it over to you now without the expectation that you're upbeat and positive, but certainly your presentation. So... Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Eric. We are going to try. So I think uh, how upbeat and positive I am depends on how well I can get Zoom to share my screen. So uh, can you guys, can you yeah, see my see slideshow? It. Perfect. Look at that. So <laughs> now, now I'm super upbeat and positive. All right. So uh, thanks again. So yeah, I think in my 20 years of being here at the Jackson County Jail, I don't know that we've had something that's so quickly kind of changed our entire order of operations and uh, every service that we could provide to the community was affected by COVID. So real quickly, just a reminder of what things look like for us at the jail before COVID, because I think that's an important piece. Um, you know, we were already busting at the seams and overcrowded and, uh, you know, lodging about 40 people a day and releasing some days half or more of those just due to the fact that we didn't have space for them. And so, um, you know, as, as kind of the initial period of COVID hit, uh, we were flooded with all of this information. And that's really where we started was uh, discussions, usually weekly, sometimes every single day uh, with local and regional health authorities uh, to try to talk about what the best approach was, not only for our jail, uh, and this was an important piece too, was, uh, we quickly entered into these constant conversations with the Oregon Jail Command Council, which is essentially uh, a representative from all of the jails in Oregon. And so we wanted to ensure that uh, nobody was just kind of off doing their own thing. And so uh, what came out of those conversations was sort of a structured kind of three-part approach that all the jails were gonna take. Uh, and, and it's stuff that we've heard everywhere. It was the cleaning, screening, and quarantine processes. So. For us, day one, mid-March, uh, we were able to work with our local partners and with kind of the efforts from everybody, we started really attacking the cleanliness of this place. And, and I think I've talked to most of you before, um, we're, we're typically pretty proud of how clean our jail is comparatively speaking anyway, uh, but I don't know that we had ever really thought about cleaning every single surface at kind of this microbial level. And so uh, you know, one of the things that's been difficult is the change in the information. And so if you all remember, uh, there were times when there was a belief that, 
it was only surface spread and there was times when it was mouth to mouth and airborne. And so uh, we kind of attacked it from the beginning, assuming that every single possibility uh, could affect us. And so county maintenance really stepped up and helped us with some of the public spaces. You know, we, like many other uh, agencies locally, we weren't able to close down. So there, there needed to be some public access. And while we were able to restrict that, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we had to keep spaces open and so county maintenance could come in if we ever thought we had an exposure they had this big i think it's called an hydrostatic sprayer so they were able to uh, clean large areas quickly and then in the secure in the office spaces really it was our employees that stepped up and uh, we're lucky that we have kind of a, a long time relationship with the ppe suppliers and the cleaning suppliers and so while there were some difficulties in getting supplies, the jails were kind of at the top of the list. And so we were able to, to keep all of those things coming that we needed. And then, you know, the inmate workers too, we, I don't want to uh, take away from the amount of work that they were doing within the housing units. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the information sharing with the adults in custody and how that went. But um, that group really stepped up. You know, everybody has wanted to make sure that they were as safe as possible. And then uh, we were able to do some things for personal hygiene for the adult and custody population. The staff, that part's simple. Um, they had the access to all the cleaning supplies already, but we went throughout the facility and every place that we could put one up, we put hand sanitizers. Anytime the adults in custody were moved from one place to another, we were really enforcing the cleaning. And, and initially, we'll talk in a minute, you know, we weren't doing all the masking stuff right in March for some reasons that we'll address, but um, the cleanliness, the hand sanitization, uh, all of that when we move from one space to another um, was really important. And so the second part of that three-part plan was a screening protocol. And again, this is something that, uh, you know, throughout the state, all the jail commanders were consistent in the fact that they needed to have some sort of screening protocol uh, but it really differed from one jail to another about what that might look like. Uh, for us here, with some input from local health authorities, uh, that was mainly a questionnaire and kind of our observations of the individual who was brought in uh, as an intake. We did a, a temperature screening pretty early in the process. It wasn't automatic, um, but really, you know, we were asking all those questions kind of like uh, the ones that have become normal now if you go to a healthcare provider. Uh, have you been in contact? Have you had a fever? Those sort of things. And because the people who we serve are not always the most honest, uh, it was important too for us that the, the staff here uh, kind of use their own observations. Early on, if somebody uh, appeared to be symptomatic in any way, really our only option was just to refuse that intake. And so uh, we talked with the local chiefs uh, and, and police officers on the street, and we knew that was problematic. We wanted to be able to develop ways to, to help that, that issue as opposed to just saying, not our problem, you go deal with it. And so our medical staff has really uh, stepped up also. You know, again, we, we contract our medical services with the company named Wellpath. Um, they've been great about performing some of that initial intake screening stuff for us. I do think this is a good point to say also to, to this day, we have not had a single confirmed case of COVID in our jail population. I'm knocking on every piece of wood that's around me right now. Um, but we've done a really good job, I think, of being able to, to identify those people up front who are potentially um, contagious. And, you know, along with that, we, we really stress to our employees, you know, law enforcement has always been this kind of a career path where people tough it out a lot. And, and uh, we really had to stress to our folks, like, now is not the time to be forcing it through some times where you don't feel well and coming to work. And, and they've been great about that, um, but not taking advantage of it either, if that makes sense. And then the other thing we did with screening uh, kind of day one was we looked at our population and we said, is there anyone here who looks to be kind of a high risk group uh, high risk individuals and uh, the couple people that fell into that category that we thought we might have here in custody. We had some conversations with the courts and district attorney's office to see if we could move them somewhere else or, or release them on their own cognizance. Um, and then the last part of that initial three part plan was what do you do with them once they get to the jail? And so 
we identified again in, in lots and lots of conversations that our best approach, and this is something that the jail is really well suited for physically, uh, and that is to group these folks in small groups for a 14 day observation period. So again, at this point, we're talking at people, about people who are not showing any symptoms. We have no reason to believe that they're, uh, they've been exposed to COVID. And so we took a large portion of our facility and we essentially uh, made each housing unit its own 14 day observation unit. And so um, anybody who came in, say over a 48 hour stretch was housed together and they stayed together and nobody else was introduced to that unit until they had all been in there 14 days and did not show any uh, symptoms of, of COVID. Once that happened, then we do, did a move to general population. And uh, so at the same time, what we were doing in general population was we were making sure that the larger housing units weren't co-mingling any more than was absolutely necessary. And so we would, uh, we would keep these potentially 14 or 16 people together for months and months and months at a time and not try to introduce anybody new into that housing unit. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, one of the things with the general population, uh, these folks were all getting their information from essentially the news. And, and if you recall early on, the news was sort of highlighting some of the worst cases throughout the entire world of what COVID was doing to communities. And so uh, it was very early on that we realized that, that some of the adults in custody were panicking and we were almost having kind of a group panic because everything they knew was coming from the worst case scenario. And so we identified a couple of our managers to go around to the different housing units and really spend time talking to people about what we were trying to do uh, to make sure that they were kept safe here. And all of this stuff, and this is really, I think, kind of to the problems that Eric talked about, uh, it required an already overstretched facility to reduce its population even more. And so in order to meet these 14-day uh, quarantine periods, we sort of targeted this number of about 230. Remember, we were at 300 or 315 initially. Uh, we needed to get down to about 230. That was even uncomfortable. Uh, but that was sort of the maximum number that we thought we could uh, maintain adequate uh, observation periods. And so we didn't do a mass release to get there. That was something that was done in other jails across the country. We instead uh, were able to sort of get to that number through attrition. If we released 20 people uh, on a given day, we just lowered our capacity by about 15. And we were able to get to the point where we were operating at that 230 number for quite a while. Um, another thing that I think is important to point out is that we never uh, refused all lodgings. That was uh, something that other jails, even within our state, our part of the state uh, did was that they refused any lodgings that weren't say a measure 11 charge. Um, we never did that. We, we instead talk to the chiefs about, kind of like Chief Clausen mentioned, just be reasonable about who you're lodging. You know, Regardless of the crime, sometimes people need to come spend a little bit of time in jail and we were able to allow that to happen up to this point. Um, we also, along with the quarantine, really worked with County Health and, and I can't stress enough how great they were uh, in their cooperation and communication with us throughout this process, but um, we talked with them about, okay, what do we do if people do appear to be symptomatic? Or I don't even think I put this in the slide, but um, what if they are a known contact of a confirmed case in our county? And so they helped us with some of the, the thoughts about what to do with that here at the jail. We're pretty lucky that we do have two uh, negative airflow cells. <clears throat> They're small, excuse me. They're small. We could probably only fit, you know, maybe six or eight people in those cells. So these would be people who would uh, appear to be symptomatic but not sick. Uh, so we knew we had that option and then we figured we would be able to arrange for the, the quickest testing possible and probably transportation to a local medical provider. Um, there were a couple incidents very early on uh, in our time period where we, we were almost convinced that we had people given their symptoms that were COVID positive. Um, again, if you recall, uh, early on, the, the tests were not fast, and so 
we actually had one gentleman who went and was admitted to the hospital. He was there six or seven days um, with what everybody assumed was COVID before the test came back and showed it was negative. So we were hyper vigilant. We, we really wanted to do whatever we could to make sure that we didn't get exposures and, a, and an outbreak in the facility. Um, so as time went on, we moved into kind of this phase two period, which was uh, now further restricting what we could do in the facility. And so as with most all of you, one of the first things that we did was we identified those areas in the jail that were non-essential and uh, did whatever we could to eliminate people uh, coming into the facility that didn't absolutely need to. And so um, a lot of that was, was like the personal visitation sort of processes and anything that was not a visitor for a legal kind of mandated purpose. And so we continued to allow uh, defense attorneys to come in and to help with criminal cases, but we haven't had a personal visitation in this jail since March. Um, what we've been able to do in place of that, uh, it says free phone calls, it's free to the inmate. The, um, the sheriff's office is paying for that service. Uh, the vendors have been great in, in doing that at kind of a reduced rate, but every adult in custody has a free phone calls and a, and a free video visit every week to try to maintain some sort of relationship with the people outside the facility, which is so important. Um, and then with the professional visits, like has been mentioned by everybody else, so I won't go too much into it. We've learned that there really are a lot of technology pieces that we can use uh, to help us out with some of that stuff. Um, so, you know, we, we have Zoom meetings and we have Skype meetings here at the facility almost every single day with adults in custody visiting with uh, like mental health and medical providers specifically, and then some with their attorneys. Um, some of the things that were really kind of heartbreaking to me and I know to a lot of the people involved in this group when COVID started was that the reduction of those non-essential pieces included some of the things we were so excited about uh, with reintroducing kind of jail programming pieces back into the facility. So the medicated, medication assisted treatment group that we were also very excited about to help those who are, help those that are opioid affected uh, was put on hold. And you know, someday we'll get back to it. But right now we are literally uh, just holding people and trying to keep them safe. Um, we did look at some work for home, from home opportunities, but most of our staff has to be here. Uh, so in about July, like I said, we initially were a bit resist, resistive to the adults in custody wearing facial coverings in the jail. There's a lot of safety issues with not being able to identify the population. And then I think, uh, I think Beth mentioned kind of facial features and identifying when people might be at a higher risk. So while staff was doing facial coverings when they couldn't maintain appropriate distance, we were not doing that with the adult and custody population. In July, a new jail standard was released for the state uh, requiring facial coverings in pandemic situations. And so we obviously followed along with that. And so now when an intake comes in within the first five to 10 minutes, they're given a mask and they wear that mask anywhere uh, that they're in a group area and our staff is all masked up all the time. So it, it's strange, you know, there have been uh, Supreme Court cases talking about facial coverings in jails for different reasons. And now it's a normal thing everywhere. Um, some other things, we've talked about these, I'll show you in a moment how they're affecting our jail population, but with uh, not having the ability to move people through the criminal justice system, they end up just sort of sitting here. And uh, also along that same line, these interstate shuttle systems that uh, run so many of the adults in our population back and forth, really across the whole country have stopped running. And so our transport teams, I think this is the fifth week in a row that our transport teams will be flying to extradite a prisoner from another state. So it's really increased the workload for those guys. Um, with that, that jail population sort of remaining stagnant for longer periods of time, uh, you should have all received an, an email today from Jasmine that shows uh, today's inmate list, today's adult in custody list. 
And if you have a chance, you know, I encourage you to look through that and see what sort of crimes are being held currently in the jail. But a quick breakdown, this is yesterday about this time that I ran it. And you can see that between the measure 11 offenders and those uh, on pretrial for state charges, and I'll tell you in virtually every one of those cases, there's a felony included. That's two thirds of our population. Um, and that is an abnormally high number for us. Uh, we have some really bad people in jail right now. Even when you fall into the other court categories, the, the parole and probation violators and the federal holds and the fugitives, you know, virtually everybody in our jail right now is either facing serious felony charges or has previous convictions of serious felony charges. As of yesterday, there was one person in our custody who was sentenced. And so when you talk about that one phase of jail operations being to try to help people who are gonna reintegrate to society, we don't have anybody like that here right now. Um, some more numbers, just real quick comparisons. These were year-to-date comparisons again as of yesterday. So you can look that while, you can see that while our lodgings um, and total releases are down about 3,000 from where they were at last year, the number of people that we've had to force out just because we're full is actually kind of per capita higher, right? So we've had to reduce that population uh, therefore, we're kicking out more people just because we're overcrowded. Um, all right, so the other big piece has been planning for the worst case scenario in our jail, which is the outbreak. Uh, I highlighted it. Nothing on this list is happening right now, um, but it is something that we've had to plan for. And again, we've, we've worked with county health. We've worked with local and state authorities. Uh, we've had tabletop style exercises to talk about uh, what would be the best response if we do have an outbreak. And so uh, the 180 or so capacity number is what the jail would really have to try to get to if we had a major outbreak. This is the number that allows us to essentially single cell and maximize the social distancing potential within the facility. Um, again, I, I encourage you to look at that list of the people who are in custody today, and you'll see that if we had to pick out uh, 50 or so of them to release into the community. We're talking about some really uh, kind of scary folks who are back in our community. We'd also at that point absolutely have to reduce uh, certain types of lodgings, um, encouraging everyone to stay away. If we had to do a mass release, there are some considerations about who would be uh, supervising those folks while they're back in the community. Um, and so you know, that's kind of a really scary, that's been the scariest kind of doomsday uh, discussion that we've had throughout this whole process. And then the other things we're doing, uh, we're planning for in case there was an outbreak and, and county health would have to help out with this, but you know, what it looks like to come in and test 180 or 200 adults in custody plus the 70 or so uh, employees that work here on any given week be a very, very large scale testing operation. And I think we'd have to have lots of help and we've, we've worked out some ways to get help for that. And then there are some different uh, philosophies out there about then how you treat the people who are left in the facility, you know, whether you house them in groups of people who are 100% known to be COVID infected uh, or whether you isolate people out. And so there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, same thing goes for how you replace the staff that's out sick at that point. And so, um, you know, just a lot of things that we've talked about in the planning and preparation stages for that. So some good things that have come out of our time is we've identified really uh, with our facility being designed the way it is, ways that we are by nature uh, able to help out the community in, in different times of need. And so, you know, one of those big areas is our kitchen. Uh, for those of you who have toured the facility before, I think our kitchen prepares as many meals as anywhere else in the Rogue Valley. I'm fairly certain of that on a daily basis. Uh, because we're set up to do that, we were able to provide some more meals. Uh, so Chief Clausen talked a little bit about the urban campground, uh, looking for ways to keep those people who are unhoused uh, from having to come into town. And we started off making meals like that initially was up to about 120 meals a day that were delivered then out uh, to different locations throughout the community. Um, they've also 
been creating meals in the kitchen to send out for those people who are in community quarantine type situations. So um, that was good. It was a good thing that we could do to help out the community a little bit. And I will also say that uh, great partners in the community have helped us to share the costs of doing that, those extra meals. Another thing that's been great about the jail, a couple more things, um, you know, by design, we can seamlessly transition people into that community quarantine type of scenario. And, and uh, you know, the jail, I don't know that it was designed or thought about as a place that would work great when you have to isolate different groups, but, uh, you know, really by nature, it helps out with that. So as we move forward, um, again, each and every week, uh, sometimes daily, we're talking about what those changes are that are coming in from the state and local authorities and, and uh, our staff has been great in their response to this and their reaction. Um, not always the most flexible group of people, but throughout this entire thing, people have been amazing. Um, testing the population within the facility. So we're working right now with a lab to actually do COVID tests of every single adult in custody who's here more than about a week. And so uh, we're working with the county and a lab within the state to try to do that and in hope reduce uh, the period, that 14 day period that people have to be observed before moving to general population. I mean, ultimately our goal is to increase the population back to that maximum level that we were working at before to best serve and help the community with all the things that you guys have heard about that are happening in the courts and the extra filings. And so really, you know, it, it's a balancing act for us and for uh, the safety of the community and the safety of the inmate population. And I thought I had a slide that said, do you have any questions? But I guess not. So I am just going to take that share off. That is all I have at this point, unless anybody's got any questions. This is Hilda. You have a question? question? Yeah. Yes. Um, you said um, that you are testing uh, the inmate population. Is the staff also tested? Yeah. So at this point, we are not testing the inmate population, okay. but that contract, it should be worked out in the next couple of weeks. So there's a lab in the Corvallis area that can do a fairly quick turnaround. Um, to answer your question though, staff can go get tested uh, whenever, we've had a couple people who thought they might have a symptom, they go down, uh, County Health works with us pretty well if they know it's one of our staff members to get a quick response um, on that. And so really at this point, it's just kind of been when people might feel like they have a need. Other questions for Josh or anybody else who presented today? All right. Well, we do have one more item of business. Um, it's not real glamorous, but the JRI money we get from the state around um, local supports to um, help, you know, get people through supervision in lieu of imprisonment. Um, every time we change kind of how we're spending that by category, they ask us to make a, a movement or a motion before the um, uh, PSCC and no matter how much it is. So, Today's total amount would be um, recognition that we need to make uh, a movement of $234.60 from admin to supplies and a $528.45 movement from personnel to supplies. So on a $3.4 million uh, budget over the biennium, uh, we are looking at, uh, it looks like, uh, $763.05 that we need to transfer into supplies. Those supplies would be used for the resource center. So uh, would entertain any discussion or a motion at this point. This is Jennifer. I'll make a motion. Thank you. We have a motion from Jennifer Lynn to approve that movement. Do we have a second? I'll second. Uh, David Carter. Oh, sorry, Beth. I saw Dave Carter's hand go up. So we have a motion and a second. Um, Jasmine, will you do a quick roll call vote of all members present uh, prior to leaving? So how about I can do this. I'll go through uh, by person. Judge Mejia, uh, your, your vote. <laughs> yeah, we can do a thumbs up, actually, right? So we have a thumbs up from Judge Mejia. Thank you. Uh, Josh Aldrich. That was his thumb. That was, that was his thumb. Okay, we'll see. Right there. Yeah. Yes. Sir Stickler? <laughs> yes. Uh, Lee Ayers? Yes. Hilda montenegro Fix. Yes. All right. Dave Carter? Yes. Rita Sullivan? Yes. Uh, Beth Heckert? Yes. Travis Christian? Yes. 
Uh, Judge Charter. Yes. All right, we have a yes from Judge Charter. Thank you. And uh, Jennifer Linda, it's your motion, but do you approve it? I do. All right. Thank you for your business today. Again, um, I think the presentations really demonstrated what this group does and how it looks in the community on a real basis. But honestly, there are offline operational conversations that happen in the spirit of this county to come together, support each other, understanding the way that this, this entire system works together. I don't think it's that common. Unfortunately, it's all I know, so I expect it. It's like, oh, yeah, you just call the sheriff or the presiding judge. But it's really amazing the way people come together like this. So I want to express my gratitude to be working in this community. Um, well, with that, we conclude our meeting for October. We'll come back together. I believe we have a rescheduled um, date in November, trying to get together before the holiday, um, knowing a lot of folks probably aren't traveling. So uh, look for that agenda, and I thank you, everybody, for your time today.